workings, courses, and other activities during the 2020 coronavirus pandemic. But Pioneer has become so much more than this in the intervening year. Pioneer is a virtual, but also very real community of like-minded orthopedists striving to help not only themselves, but one another. With the latest video conferencing and educational technology, as well as a groundbreaking online platform, SIGOT's Pioneer events, activities, and resources are reaching every corner of the globe, with over 55,000 views of our webinars so far. We're forging new partnerships, signing agreements with 12 other international academic societies, and building an enduring network we hope will last for many years to come. So, what can you expect from us? Free webinars led by key opinion leaders from around the world and across all fields of orthopedic surgery and traumatology, as well as chat shows with some of the most interesting and inspiring surgeons on the planet. Opportunities to take an interactive role in these webinars by participating in polls and live discussions. Free on-demand Pioneer playback service. Watch our webinars again and again in your own time, and coming soon. Our new bespoke learning management system will host podcasts, an online version of the famous SICOT Diploma Exam, virtual training modules, surgical technique courses, a discussion forum, and much, much more. We hope you'll join us on this pioneering journey as we push the boundaries of what is possible in online orthopedic education together. Good day and welcome to the SICOT Pioneer webinar. To all Pioneer fan club members watching us live today, happy Eid Mubarak. And may the year ahead continue to bless us with even more educational opportunities and achievements. I'm Garrison Thevindran, Southern Orthopedic Surgeon from Singapore, Chair of the SICOT Education Academy. And it's a, very, it's a pleasure to extend a very warm welcome from SICOT Pioneer to all of you logging in from various corners of the world. It's truly an honor for us at SICOT Pioneer to host today's webinar. It's the 52nd in our series of Pioneer webinars. To date, we've had over 80,000 webinar viewings, both live and on demand, since we started Pioneer back in June 2020. And I'd like to take this opportunity to thank the Pioneer team, with special mention to Sufian, the SICOT head office, for their tireless work providing year-round quality of virtual education. A personal note of thanks to SICOT's Education Committee Chair, Dr. Arindam Banerjee, Vice Chair of the Education Committee, Dr. Sasi Shanmagasundram, for moderating today's session on the changing platform of orthopedic education. For the global audience watching this live, please post your comments and questions in the discussion box as we progress through this webinar today. To our on-demand audience, thank you very much for following us, and we look forward to your enthusiastic support as we journey through this virtual educational trail in 2023. And on that note, Arindam, over to you. Thank you, Gaur. Thank you for that introduction. And um, just start. Thank you. Okay, are you getting the slides? Have they come? Okay, great. So, um, hello everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, good night, whatever it is in your part of the world. Today we're going to be talking about changing educational methods in orthopedics after the COVID um, pandemic, which we recently got over. And I think... Uh, COVID has had a very important influence on the way we deal with educational platforms. Um, the uh, global astrology, uh, astrology market is valued at $20.8 billion. That was the figure in 2021. 
and it is projected to nearly double in 2031. And yet, did any astrologer predict COVID? I don't think so. So we were completely caught unawares. The only person who, using the science of epidemiology, sent us a warning a few years in advance was Bill Gates, but I don't think people realized how serious an epidemic we would face. So what we have to realize is that the future belongs to those who prepare for it. And basically, civilization has many definitions, but the one I like the most is that civilization means being prepared for the future. So you look at your past, you tackle the present, and you realize what are the shortcomings, and then you take steps so that you can be prepared for a similar disaster in the future. But as Gao just said, that it's not just about dealing with a disaster. These methods which we have picked up during COVID times will help us even when we do not have a crisis because it is going to add to educational platforms all over the world. Now, how is this relevant to this seminar, these virtual meetings? Well, the lessons we have taken from COVID is that academic activity does not need to stop just because face-to-face -face meetings and conferences are not possible. So it's quite possible to have a full academic calendar to realize uh, and learn things, new things. And today, with in 2023, with all the powerful online teaching tools, we can fill the void which has been left by F2F meetings. And we are going to, today is the day we are going to discuss these powerful online teaching tools. And uh, we're going to find out what the online um, technology can do for us in education. And one more word I would like to add is that as an ex extrapolation of this concept, now we are gradually hearing a lot about online robotic surgery. So that's basically an ex extrapolation of this same idea that you sit in another continent, you sit in a different room, and you can operate on your patient. But today, of course, we are not operating, but we are looking at the tools we have for education, for operating, for courses, for learning. And this is going to be taken forward by our brilliant team here, our uh, galaxy of stars. So Mark Hansen from Munich, Germany, he's going to talk about online live surgeries. Then cadaveric programs are going to be discussed by Dr. Althani from UAE. My vice chair, uh, Shashi, will talk about virtual reality in orthopedics, in which he has a lot of experience. Steve Cheong from Hong Kong. I know Hong Kong is a good center for this uh, because my predecessor in this group, uh, Frankie Leong, used to conduct several orthopedic courses. So he's going to talk about orthopedic courses. And in fact, we have been conducting a lot of courses in, from, from India. In fact, from this chair, we've conducted quite a few pan-India uh, courses and online global courses. And finally, Mark Patterson from the UK is going to talk about online orthopedic examinations. And some of us here are examiners in SICOT, in the SICOT diploma. And he's going to tell us how they are preparing to hold the SICOT diploma on an online basis. I think this is going to be important for all of us. So I think overall, we've tried to touch all the topics which are relevant. And many of these topics are unknown to me personally as well. So I look forward to learning from them. And with this, I finish my introduction. And I first request um, Dr. Mark Hansen to start his lecture on online life surgeries. Thank you. I will stop my share now. So good day, everyone. I hope everyone can see the shared screen. Yes. 
Um, it's a pleasure for me to um, give a little talk and inspire you about the changes that have happened in the educational field in the last couple of years. And um, on purpose, I say in the uh, um, last years or even decades, because COVID was an accelerator. We already had a couple of technologies at hand um, facilitating, for example, live surgeries. And I would like to give an introduction how um, uh, innovations uh, were a little bit disruptive and were catalyzed by COVID that um, we know have um, such a, a vast option of educational tools at hand, for example, online live surgeries. So I'm Mark. I'm one of the senior uh, consultants here at the Technical University in Munich, and um, I'm specialized in um, uh, trauma surgery. So the broadcast of live surgery is not really that new, and it's not an invention of the COVID pandemic or the COVID area. Uh, for several years, the idea of broadcasting live surgery has already existed. For example, here you can see um, in the picture a live surgery which has been broadcasted in a meeting of orthopedic surgeons. And live surgery broadcast used to be part of um, surgical conferences. It was until COVID really picked on uh, um, on uh, digitalization and uh, digital transformation, um, live surgery broadcast was majorly restricted to the uses as an add-on in these conferences. These live surgeries in surgery conferences had some drawbacks. They used to be very expensive, you needed a fully equipped TV team. You needed all the infrastructure, sometimes um, even wiring from the OR, hard wiring from the OR to the um, uh, conference, which uh, uh, was mostly located directly in the hospital, needed to be done. It was quite time consuming in the preparation because the infrastructure was not very well um, established. Um, there were huge problems in the workflow of the conference itself. Um, some of you uh, might remember sitting in one of the conference halls or the lecture rooms uh, of a conference waiting um, for the live surgery to start. Often there were delays going on. Um, so there was a huge uh, um, bunch of uh, drawbacks and limitations. And um, to sum it up, what did we experience? We experienced, due to the missing infrastructure, variable quality. It always depended on the on the setup, which was um, newly set up and established for the conference, and um, the limited availability of the resources um, and the surgeons actually willing to perform this surgery. I already introduced the idea of disruption or the term disruption. So what's, what's up with the word disruption? What does it actually mean? And why is disruption actually um, um, a process we are um, encountering now uh, leading us towards more online live surgery? So um, different technological uh, uh, innovations um, can be identified to be disruptive um, or digitally disruptive. So we all know that video streaming is broadly available even in the private setting. You are able to video stream um, uh, your experiences at a beach to your loved ones if you want to. We do have a bandwidth availability, which is just tremendous. So video streaming does not need any infrastructure to be set up, but bandwidth availability is given at hand. 
Mostly in our operating rooms, we already have infrastructure already set up for different purposes. For example, for documentation of the pathology, we do already have camera systems. These might be used for online live surgeries. So numerous different technological advantages or advances and digital advances um, are to be considered as a disruption and um, make it easy to offer online life surgeries. So it, the innovation is being accelerated. I just want to point out um, uh, one very important um, um, uh, definition matter. Please do not confuse digitization with digital transformation. So we do have all these technological gimmicks, these innovations, for example, new imaging systems. Um, but the mere presence of a new technology will not give you some sort of new innovation uh, process. So the digital transformation is actually um, the process of having a technical innovation like the availability of video broadcasting and taking it into new educational formats um, we are discussing right now. So what we actually see is talking about online life surgeries, virtual reality in orthopedics and all that stuff in education. It's a transformation of how we see education. COVID has been a catalyzer. The disruption um, uh, was actually sped up. We saw that um, all the innovation changed education and teaching academics, how we used to do it, in the times of the high COVID uh, pandemic, 21, 22, 23, there was a huge need which propelled all these innovations forward. And we were encountered um, uh, with a challenge to actually adopt new and often unfamiliar practices um, in the teaching academics. All of us in the faculty will still remember the first um, uh, teaching experience using Zoom or WebEx or whatever. So let's go back to online life surgeries in academia. Um, there's a nice study um, from colleagues in northern Germany who actually looked at um, online life surgeries, which were offered to students. Um, and about 70 students were um, questioned. And um, as you can see, uh, the white uh, uh, bars will show you totally apply or applies. Um, uh, the students agreed that um, the online life surgery should be a fixed component in the curriculum. There is a huge gain of knowledge. It, the uh, quality offered for the online life surgeries was superb, as you can see here. The only um, uh, um, a drawback, as stated by the students, was basically they were not willing to pay for online life surgery, so it should be um, uh, freely granted. We have to talk about two big topics when we uh, consider online life surgery um, as a key component in education. First of all, we have to talk about higher risk for patients. So do online life surgeries constitute a higher risk for patients? And then we have to talk about ethical points um, very briefly. So in a um, huge study um, um, from the obstetric department, um, it was actually shown in an outcome analysis that um, uh, online life surgery does not constitute a higher risk for patients uh, intraoperatively or postoperatively as compared with non-broadcasted procedures. So that's one of the biggest studies actually looking at does online life surgery constitute a high risk for patients? No, it does not. But we do see some ethical issues. It's not so easy to actually broadcast um, images of a patient. We all know that taking pictures of a patient needs a consent, for example. When you broadcast um, a patient,
infections surgery, even um, have online surgery broadcasted um, with a loss of control. So you do not know where it is going. It's not just going into one of the conference rooms, um, but it's being distributed and stored and you can actually pop it up six or seven months later. Um, there uh, are ethical issues arising. And um, um, a very interesting study um, from 21 actually showed that um, the assessment of the ethical issues um, between surgeons and attendees of online life surgery conducted um, differs. So the surgeon actually sees ethical concerns regarding the life surgery because the surgeon oversees there are more problems to the patient. Sometimes there are things that might not um, uh, be so good within the operating room. And um, here the attendees um, uh, don't really show any, any ethical concerns. The discrepancy um, in some, the discrepancy between how the surgeon and the attendees see as the ethical issues actually points out that um, we have to take ethical issues um, uh, seriously. The conflict in itself is that a surgical procedure for the patient is taking place simultaneously to um, an online event um, so you have to make sure um, that all ethical uh, points and the justifications are um, set prior to the event. What might be alternatives? As you can see here, that's um, image material from the uh, AO in Davos in Switzerland. Um, here, live surgery is being offered um in a cadaver lab and we will have cadaver programs in a second um being shown by said but um that might be an alternative for online life surgery because you do have a high interaction between attendees and surgeons you have a very well equipped um uh, video uh, um studio or or tv studio attend High reproducible quality, higher degree of interaction through the windows and all the stuff. Um, and practically no ethical issues and no patient risk. A very big advantage of uh, these um, uh, shards, as uh, you can see here, would be the time flexibility. So you basically start the surgery when um, the attendees are available. And you can actually, for example, use life like fracture simulation and programs like organize your plan, know your implant, define your plan, operate your plan, challenge your plan, which are embedded in the life surgery. So there seems to be an option um, which is quite attractive um, for online life surgery. Thank you so much. And I'm very much open for questions. We have the discussion at the end, Mark, so we just proceed to the next topics. So uh, may I request uh, Dr. Saeed Alpani from UAE to please talk about cadaveric programs. You can see my presentation? Yes, yes. So when we talk about education, uh, we're talking about surgical education. And surgical education uh, requires skills. And as we know, that specific training and practice required to develop the procedure knowledge for appropriate cognitive skills. And surgeons need to be trained to be judged for the correctness of their action. So. We know 
tra- uh, historically that surgical training supplemented by cadaver dissection is always there, which is used as an injunction to the operative uh, education. But with the recent changes and guidelines in residency and competency, uh, there will be a limited uh, resident independence in the operating uh, room. Uh, and that's to master the, the skills you will need a longer time to, to do that. And uh, this is uh, limited exposure might uh, decrease the resident confident and uh, diminish the st- surgical skill set. So this is also not just from the resident point, but also from the attendee who would allow uh, his resident to do more uh, surgical work uh, autonomy. And this has brought a fear of surgery because uh, a fear of anatomy. And uh, when we talk about what is in the literature, Sirvansan and Ashkari shows that with their cadaver curriculum increased resident autonomy for as both resident and faculty had improved confidence in the trainee's operative skill. So once you, the faculty see that his uh, resident is already performing this procedure in cadaver, that will encourage the faculty to give him more independent uh, under supervision in the operating room, which is promote uh, escalating in the surgical skill of the resident. And when we go back to how cadaver simulation influence learning in orthopedics, we know that it's, it's a cognitive skills because it's a hand-on experience. And this way they can do full procedure without uh, consultant takeover. And they can learn a new technology and they need uh, supervision of the subspeciality attending surgeon because they need the real-time performance feedback and tips and tricks, and especially they need to get the practice with a new dual approach. That's not commonly done in a day-to-day business. Also, we noticed that this is enhance the learning uh, of both technical and non-technical skills in the junior residents and allow them to transfer the skills they learn to the uh, real world operating theater more uh, uh, faster. And uh, when we come to the senior resident, we notice uh, this study that uh, the operative fluency and independency and confidence is rapidly improved in the senior resident which what you want for these uh, residents before they finish their training to be able to go full independent. But that's also require a special guidelines when we come to cadaver training, which we talk about. It's a deliberate practice where it has a guided by an expert or skill coach or mentor with an uh, expert eyes and these coaches and mentors, they need to offer a feedback, not just doing the procedure. You can do the procedure for a longer time again and again, but without the real feedback, you can't repeat the same mistake. So you need to get the proper feedback so you can get a correction of your skills and master it better. And this is another study by uh, uh, Hannah James. A 22 resident, uh, you're using a deliberate practice model. They became more confident in gaining after the course among the most junior resident and more satisfaction when they perform a complex procedure in cadaver than a simple one. And uh, also by receiving intensive and direct feedback from the faculty, they make a rapid skill gain in a short amount of time. So having a cadaver and hands-on and with the feedback, it's always improved their skills. So with the cadaver uh, training is a must as we go through a different type of uh, limited training uh, exposure and uh, limited independency in the operating room for our residency program. So advantage, as we mentioned before, 
it's better appreciation, your vascular and soft tissue uh, skills, uh, haptic feedback, and psychological stimulation of real operating theater, enhance both technical and non-technical skills. Yes, it is expensive. It needs more uh, administrative effort setup, and participants get only one attempt in each procedure. Yes, we know that. So this cadaveric training program should be used wisely through their training, and it should be a used and adjunct with other modality of training to make uh, the resident uh, prepared in a stepwise uh, uh, fashion. So we have other modalities which will be done uh, talking about, which is a virtual reality, which I think it's a must. This is, can be used and junk to this in the surgical training, to the cadaver training, and also the simulator, which can be done. This is an arthroscopy uh, journal, 2013, shows about shoulder arthroscopy, simulator training, and 17 uh, first year uh, medical student with no experience in shoulder arthroscopy. Nine of 17 were given virtual reality simulator training before the arthroscopy procedure. And we noticed that the one who has a simulator group done faster arthroscopic procedure tasks. So it usually improve their skills and make it fast. The, and what we don't know is how long they will keep it, but I think when they once they get the skills and they, they develop it, they will retain it once they do it more in the independent real world time. So in conclusion, cognitive skill training enhanced ability uh, for uh, correctly execute surgical skills. Cadaver curriculum increases residents' autonomy and operative fluency, independence, and confidence can be rapidly improved. Deliberate practice training guided by an expert and provide a feedback. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Altani. And uh, we will come back and discuss this in detail after the uh, uh, lectures are given, so may I request my colleague, Dr. Shashi, to please talk about virtual reality in orthopedics. Good day, everyone, and thank you for joining us for today's program on changing educational methods post-COVID. I shall be talking about a very interesting topic that is virtual reality in orthopedics. I am Dr. Sasinda, Professor of Orthopedics and a shoulder and knee arthroscopy surgeon from Puducherry in South India. I shall be covering this interesting topic in the following subheadings. I do not have any conflict of interest to disclose. Okay. One fine day on January 15, 2009, an Airbus A320 landed on the Hudson. The captain of the flight was Captain Sully, and he, like any other captain of aviation industry, has rehearsed this particular scenario of landing on a water body several times in a flight simulator. There was no casualty during this episode. Later, when Sir Leon Donaldson, the Chief Medical Officer of Britain, spoke about this, he said flight simulator training was one of the major reasons why there was no casualty during this landing. And he had suggested that this is also done for most of the surgeons. Since then, there have been a lot of debate on the outcomes and complications happening after healthcare and the healthcare industry was a lot compared with the aviation industry and people suggested that a lot of safety measures and uh, training, virtual training be done in healthcare similar to aviation safety, aviation industry. So, what is virtual reality? 
virtual reality is a computer generated environment with scenes and objects that appear to be real, allowing the people to interact with simulated environments. Is it a new technology? No. This has dated back from the 1800s. However, recently there has been a lot of push into this technology. Before I get into the depth of the of virtual reality, these are the terminologies I may be using. Virtual reality systems, they have two major components. One is the software and the other is the hardware. The user, he moves about with some sensors in his hand, on his body or mounted on his head. The sensors send inputs, that is data, to the software that is processed by the hardware and in return there is some data and output that is sent back to the virtual reality device like a head, mo head mounted display device or your telephone or whatever. So the virtual environment reacts to your movement that is the real environment and there is some kind of interaction and this gives rise to the virtual reality experience. What are the types of devices that can be used for virtual reality? It can be just our basic mobile phone or they can be head mounted devices. Head mounted devices are of two types. One is video see-through devices. In this video see-through devices, the person, the user is completely separated from the external real world and he sees everything inside the device. Whereas in the optical see-through displays or devices, for example, the Microsoft hologram, the person also sees the real world and the virtual things and virtual objects are superimposed on the real world like is being shown here. There is a table over there that is real and you see a virtual building that you can work on in, in this particular technique. So what are the types of virtual reality? The types keeps increasing over time, but right now we can say there are around six types. The non-immersive type, the semi-inversive virtual reality, fully immersive virtual reality, and then the augmented reality, mixed reality, and we also have collaborative VR. What is non-immersive virtual reality? In non-immersive virtual reality, the user interacts with a virtual environment, usually through a computer or a character. In the case of a video game, the uh, there is a character through which the person interacts with the computer. The user does not directly interact with the virtual environment. Our team's ultimate goal in is to create immersive a virtual reality. Body. This is in between a non immersive and a fully immersive virtual reality. A computer screen or a virtual glass is being used. The person or the user can move around in the virtual environment. But other than the visual experience, there is no physical sensation or feedback that the user gets. For example, a virtual tour into a hospital, a virtual tour of a region of the body. These are examples. In a fully immersive virtual reality, the user is completely separated from the real world. The user feels like he is physically present in the virtual world. Special equipments are needed. For example, the virtual glass, VR glasses or gloves or joysticks in the hands of the person. The data from these sensors are used by the computer and the virtual world responds to this in real time to provide a really realistic virtual experience. For example, after reconstruction with a CT scan, a comminuted distal tibia fracture in, your, in the virtual world, you can try to rearrange the fragments and you can try to put a plate, you can um, realign it, you can move the plates and screws and you can try to understand how the reconstruction is going to be. Similarly, a comminuted femoral head fracture or an acetabular fracture can be studied preoperatively in the same way 
virtually and you can try to understand where are the fragments where are they fitting well and how are you going to go about it so you can plan your approach you can plan the actual surgical procedure and also the implants before the actual surgery or you can even learn total hip or total knee replacement surgery virtually with the joysticks and the virtual reality device similarly for a shoulder replacement can have a hands on experience virtually how to go ahead with the surgical approach how to perform the procedure and similarly for a hip arthroscopy procedure so that is immersive virtual reality an advancement of this is augmented reality in augmented reality the virtual the virtual world is superimposed over the real world for example just um, take the simple example of your google lens in your google translate when you place the phone with the google lens on and place it over a different language you just see the actual uh, converted language for example english so this is augmented reality the virtual thing that is the translated language is superimposed over the wall this is augmented reality this is a very good example of augmented reality being used in day to day life by everyone of us similarly the google glass for example uh, when you are wearing a google glass there could be prompts depending on the external for example the subway station is closed uh, there is a lot of traffic in this direction these are actual information that are super added to the real world this is augmented reality and then we have mixed reality the problem in augmented reality is the virtual things don't interact with the real things or the virtual world do not interact with the real world but in mixed reality the virtual world also reacts with the real world for example this is an illustration where uh, this is a virtual reality the virtual world is completely separate from the real world in augmented reality the virtual world coexists with the real world but they cannot interact with each other they can't give a handshake but in mixed reality the virtual world can interact with the real world oh my gosh this is a game changer so this is an example of uh, mixed reality back from from different angles i think over at is possible augmentation in addition to interaction so the surgeon can see augmentations like the surface markings the location for the future screw placement during pedicle screw fixation or the entry site for a k wire and he can plan his surgery accordingly this is mixed reality so all of these fall under the single umbrella of extended reality virtual reality mixed reality augmented reality all together is called extended reality and then finally we can have collaborative vr in collaborative vr the users from different locations can interact together in the virtual environment for example um, user a and user b are located in different locations but they can come together in the virtual environment and try to do one surgical procedure together that's also the example with a uh, pubg video game where different people from different places play one video game together so what are the most common applications of virtual reality in surgical training this can be used for pre operative surgical training pre operative planning and also for intra operative navigation during the surgery this has been very commonly used for in the form of arthroscopy simulators and fully immersive operative simulations have been used for trauma management and joint replacement surgeries so what are the evidence there is enough evidence to show that virtual reality training for orthopedic surgery residents improves surgical performance also it provides a safe and accessible complement to orthopedic surgical training outside the operation room without actually involving the patients so also increasing the safety of the patient all these concepts revolve around the concept of attentional capacity threshold 
should understand that humans can comprehend and assess only a finite amount of information at one point of time any additional information gets ignored so there is a difference between a master surgeon and a novice surgeon a novice surgeon keeps looking at his hand and keeps watching himself to see whether he is doing the right thing but he does not have in his capacity threshold attentional capacity in order to watch what exactly he is doing whether he is improving the patient's condition whereas the master surgeon does not watch himself and he is able to provide the additional attentional capacity for the care of the patient hence we are simulation training for the novice surgeon can increase the attentional capacity a lot and improve the outcomes of the patient so there are a lot of benefits precision in surgery decrease radiation it is time saving it can be a great opportunity to assess the trainee's competence it provides low risk environment for trainees and predictable availability and it is also uh, the evidence is also emerging regarding its validity however it's a nascent technology it is expensive there can be initial disorientation the learning curve could be slightly steep there are limited number of procedures in which you can learn by virtual reality what are the future future applications of virtual reality this can be used in addition to training and intraoperative assistance in rehabilitation and physical therapy patient education and communication and telemedicine and remote consultations so to end virtual reality and extended reality are extensively evolving they have vast benefits however they can be expensive we can look forward to the cost to come down and they may be the need of the future as was said earlier we have to be prepared for the future and this could be the answer to learning in the future thank you thank you shashi for a comprehensive talk and now we will proceed to online orthopedic courses to be given by steve chung of hong kong thank you so i'm not steve chung from hong kong i'm from the uh, university of hong kong and uh, i myself is a uh, bone replacement surgeon so i would like to thank the sick uh, court for inviting me to uh, have my own sharing and presentation regarding online courses so my topic would be the uh, online orthopedic courses so i think uh, in general for uh in the covid era we are all familiar with different types of online learning which one with webinar so i think all of us at have attending uh hundreds if not dozens of webinar during these few years if you search of a few minute webinar in the google you can see there's a lot of research result when i prepare my talk i'm a bit interested on about how many number of webinar are there available in the web so i search about orthopedics gynecology and other specialty and the final that of orthopedic our colleagues are quite hard working the number one rank of number of webinar is internal medicine followed by surgery and we are actually the third we have more than uh, 10000 uh research result if i search about orthopedic uh, webinar so i think uh secot our pioneer has been one of the pioneer in setting up the webinar since the um covid era the first one has been performed in october year 2020 and since then we have organized more than 52 uh webinar throughout the years uh with a very good response so i think uh i think to in order to organize a good webinar you need to have a good moderator and also limit your time if you want to set up your own for example this is the one i participate in that is limited to three or four talks from international expert you need to have a good moderator and encourage your audience to interact with the speakers um and uh try to engage all the speaker in the same uh session and hopefully they can contribute more about their experience 
And uh, in our in our SQL experience, uh, we can see we involve nearly all types of orthopedic specialty, also include uh, research and also rehabilitation. One of the key is you need to have a good partner if you want to uh, organize different type of webinar. You can see during the last 15 webinar, we have all types of collaborators from different specialty, including AO, ESACOS, and EHS, all type of um, collaborator to help us to organize a webinar, which is uh, important and good for you if you want to make one for your institution to have a good collaboration with some international organization. The second one would be the um, virtual meeting. That's two types of meetings. So back to year 201, which is the time at the peak of our COVID uh, pandemic. At that time, we have changed our program to from a uh, full face-to-face -face program into a hybrid program, which include a uh, virtual program element that the audience can join, which is uh, the contingency plan at that time. So as you see, while there's still some uh, audience attend, all are mandatory need to wear masks to uh, prevent um, infection. Apart from hybrid, sometimes you have to force to use a full virtual program. For example, in the last year, our Secret Young Surgeon meeting in Cambridge, we converted the program into a full um, virtual program. Uh, due to the limitation of the um, COVID. So we have still have a very wonderful program, but all the uh, audience and uh, the presenter have to join it as a uh, virtual, as a full uh, virtual type of uh, engagement. The AO Davos course in year 2020 is the so far the only one, and I hope it's the only one uh, Davos course need to be held at a virtual um platform you can see they have a with their it support they have made a very wonderful uh virtual platform so all the audience can feel like they are actually joining the women uh the event in davos with the interaction with all the uh speaker and the delegates so if you um trying to organize similar virtual women i think a good it support is very important to make your program more interactive and also have a very nice virtual background so they won't get lost and keep engaged. CCJR is also an example. CCJR is the one of the biggest um, uh, of orthopedic conference in the context of joint replacement surgery every year. Again, in year 2002, they organized their so far the only one uh, virtual, full virtual um, conference in the online session, uh, full uh, online. But they also stress that they are not just a an other virtual meeting, but they try their best to include their interactive experience. For example, the live surgery, the virtual surgery that has been described by our previous uh, speaker. In you can see that even it is a so-called virtual meeting, they did uh, read the arranged uh, surgical demonstration, and also there's a plan of discussion with the audience. They have a very good platform. Every audience can submit a question directly, and nearly all the questions from the audience are answered answer by the uh, faculty during the meeting. I think this is a very good, important element so you can catch your uh, audience attention. In fact, even after year two, since year two one, they go back to the live uh, conference, but they also add a component of a hybrid. That means you can choose not to join it in person and you can pay less and you can uh, attach this problem. I think that will be the future direction of all this type of mega of repeated audience because uh, from their result, they say that using the online component, they will not reduce the number of participants. Actually, the whole number of participants increase because not all of us can really go to their site to join the program, but they are we are all interested in their content. Therefore, I choose to join it as a virtual. So I think uh, I'm sure uh, that might be the direction to go if you're organizing future of the conference. The last one, probably the most important one will be the uh, online course. So online course is not a uh, new thing to us. Even before COVID era, there's a numerous course organized by many uh, organizations like AOS, the BJJ, the uh, EFOR. But we all understand that the number of online calls increased a lot after the development of the COVID. Um, 
usually the course uh, overview I've shown usually after the course registration, you need to have some e-learning material uh, followed by video or live lecture and also self-assessment exercise. The assessment usually is a type of virtual exam. If possible, um, you uh, need to organize a, uh, a submission of some project and allow an interactive discussion with the tutor of the course. It finally will lead to certification. So I, this is one of the courses I attended, which is I think is for comprehensive and also fit for all who pick surgery regardless of your specialty. This is about research. So you can see it's a kind of MCQ question during your self-assessment, but you can see that after you choose the answer, they have a very detailed explanation about why you choose this answer and why you're wrong. I think that's very important than just a simple MCQ. And after MCQ, actually, you can see the response from other audience and also show that why the, the audience or the participant can explain why you choose that answer and have an interaction with the course coordinator. I think this is an important component if you want to make a good successful online courses. Therefore, for CCOP, we have also have our own system known as the LMS, the learning management system, in which one of the major components will be online orthopedic training course in all different types of specialties. So I hope this system will be up and running um, in next year in all specialty if possible. So stay tuned for us. So regarding the results, so how do you think online courses is at good or even better than traditional teaching? Well, there's a few study on it. This is a study from uh, Saudi Arabia asking about the uh, medical student performance using this kind of online teaching. It found out that if they use the uh, blue one is a traditional teaching, the yellow one is Zoom teaching. You can see the gray is statistically significantly better if you're using Zoom courses compared to conventional teaching. This uh, result is supported by other study as well. This is another study uh, from Chile asking about the response or the feeling of the resident regarding online courses. You can see that they rate webinar and online presentation pretty, pretty good. And they most of them will agree they should continue this type of format even after the COVID era. And other study asking about their opinion on how they feel about the online academic activity. You can see that most of them think that it is easier to join an online course or more effective compared with conventional uh, teaching. This is a review article about a systemic review of different study on this topic. You can see that many of the residents have joined some kind of online courses and most agree that it's quite easy to join this kind of courses and even more effective than conventional teaching. But nevertheless, if you ask them about if they want to have a clinical, clinical case discussion, they most of them will still prefer a conventional type of uh, teaching. We also did our survey uh, as, asking about our uh, CCOM members' uh, opinion about the research education for some, or online courses. You can see that most of them will agree for an online course rather than just a simple uh, education day or uh, a hybrid meeting. However, we all understand that there's some drawback. The most important drawback will be the web minute fatigue. I think all of us have tried to sleep during attending some kind of online courses. So the problem would be the maintaining of attention span of the audience if you want to engage them in the online courses. Moreover, there's something we cannot change is the atmosphere or interaction with other audience. For example, in the last year CCOM meeting, we go back to the face-to-face -face format. There's a lot of social activity and interaction with other audience. So I think this can never be replaced by the online courses. So in conclusion, I think COVID can accelerate the development of online teaching. Both web and online course emerge as a new format of orthopedic education. This new option, be it virtual or hybrid, may transform the future format of conventional orthopedic conferences. While the early response of this kind of online teaching seems quite good, I think the face-to-face -face teaching is still important as a component of knowledge exchange and community development. So thank you for your attention. Thank you, Steve. Uh, for a comprehensive coverage of the topic. And we now come to the last talk before the summary and conclusion. Uh, and this is going to be given by Mark Patterson from the UK. And he's going to speak about the upcoming SICOT diploma and what are the changes to the examination system, the way they're the way forward and what they're thinking. So this is important for all of us. Okay. <clears throat> uh Good uh, morning, everybody. Uh, we're on the home straight now. Uh, my name is Mark Patterson. 
Uh, I'm chief examiner for CCOT, and I've also examined for the College of Surgeons for many years. Uh, but my knowledge of online exams before COVID was precisely zero. Um, I make no bones about the fact that I've taken a lot of this information today from Vikas Kanduja's excellent paper published in 2021 on virtual exams. So these are some of the subjects we're going to talk about today, um, talking about online exams. So the first thing to talk about is the validity of computer-based assessment. Uh, and there's quite a lot in undergraduate training. There's much less in postgraduate training, um, but this is now coming through with the College of Surgeons, particularly with the MRCS examination. Mark, so with uh, the your screen, sorry. Sorry. Um, you need to share your screen. Oh, so, I thought you'd. I thought you'd got it. Have you not got it? No. Mm. Right. Yeah, perfect. We need to go to the slideshow. Okay. Okay, can you see it now? Yeah. Okay. yeah. Right, so you heard, heard me talk about the uh, the first um, uh, few slides. So we're talking about um, the multiple choice questions, uh, and similar exam scores are awarded both with uh, online exams and face-to-face. -face. So we're happy that the computer-based MCQ assessment is 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 valid. Now, with the vivas, uh, you have the objective problems as well as uh, subjective problems. So, um, objectively, if we uh, have a good scoring system and the uh, examiners are well taught, then we can have good objective uh, scores. Subjectively, it's slightly different because you have to check that the candidate in front of you uh, is going to behave in the same way as he would in a face-to-face -face exam. So you've got to check that they're going to be fluent, creative. You you note the degree of nervousness, uh, cultural differences, and their language. So for all of this, you need sufficient audiovisual quality uh, and you need a good environment uh, so that the candidate can give their best. So you need good technical quality. Now, uh, we frequently use OSCEs in examination, objective structured clinical examination. And the one thing about online examining is it is difficult to examine clinically. It's difficult to examine patients online. And during COVID, when we were undertaking MRCS, instead of examining a patient in front of the examiner, we had to say to the candidate, uh, would you examine this hip as if the patient was in front of you, which is not entirely satisfactory. So uh, for an online exam to be successful, both the trainee and the trainer or the examiner has to be happy. There has to be accessibility by both the examiner and the candidate. Uh, you should be able to save money. You have to have very good administration, however, and there are challenges to the implementation. Uh, you have to have a, a different set of questions for every exam. You need a very large question bank to set it all up. Uh, and we had a problem with the MRCS where a lot of questions had to be uh, removed because they thought there had been a, a security lapse. You need very good IT support and you need to instruct and troubleshoot the candidates before they sit the exam. And this is what we did with the first uh, CCOT diploma online MCQ exam. Uh, where we had a sort of trial run the week before, and we're going to be doing the same sort of thing with the next uh, MCQ online exam, which is happening on the 5th of May. Now, exam security is important. You have to make sure that the candidate in front of you is who he or she says they are. 
you have to have continuous authentication and you have to have some form of proctoring. Now, live proctoring is very, very expensive uh, and there are various ways you can do that and each exam has got to work out exactly how they're going to do this. And you have to prevent uh, people from cheating. So everybody has to sit the exam at the same time. The questions can only be accessible for a short period of time, so they can't uh, dial up Google to answer the question. You can only uh, answer the question, you only see the questions one at a time, and then you have to answer that within a certain period of time, and then that question has gone. And then the next question comes up, and you do not have the opportunity to go back and access the question again. So, as you know, we have the uh, uh, CCOT Diploma Examination is now online on uh, CCOT Pioneer on the LMS system. And with regard to the online exam, um, the, the main uh, people involved here have been uh, Vikas Kanduja, Kao Tivandran and Khalid Saraf have been uh, instrumental in getting this um, online. So we have had the first uh, CCOT Diploma MCQ online. The next one is in two weeks time. We've had trial runs with the online Vivas uh, and we hope that will go uh, online soon and uh, candidates will have the opportunity to sit the exam online or in face-to-face -face fashion at the uh, annual conference. So from my platform, I have the chief examiner platform here. I can manage the exam questions. I can look at the dashboard. I can see the exam questions. I can see how many people are going to sit the exam. I can review the exam results. And I can do a question analysis report and see who tried the, exam, uh, the questions, how they did, whether they're easy or difficult. So with the uh, Viva, we've, as I say, we've had one or two mock exams. Uh, this is all organized through Strategil, who are the IT company helping uh, Seacorp Pioneer LMS. Uh, and I pay great tribute to them for their professionalism, and they are incredibly helpful, and they help us through our, all our little problems. So when the candidate comes along, they will log in uh, to the Pioneer. Uh, then they log in to CCOT. We tell them how to get into the uh, system. Uh, then they come up uh, to their dashboard. And the next slide shows how uh, they will go into room one where they'll sit adult pathology. Uh, then they'll move on after 30 minutes into basic science and then 30 minutes into trauma and then 30 minutes into upper limb and pediatrics. So they will see the same examiners uh, for the same period of time um, as they do in the face-to-face -face exam. So we have the equivalent exam, both face-to-face -face and online. Um, so they can join the meeting and then after 30 minutes, they leave that uh, meeting and then they join the, the next meeting in basic science, etc. So the conclusions of online exams are that uh, it's here to stay. Um, there are benefits for the trainee and the trainer. Uh, because it, is, it can be, can be more uh, convenient and it can be cheaper. We can undertake MCQ and Viva exams. Uh, the clinical exams are still to be sorted out, uh, and I think uh, that's going to remain a little bit of a problem. The results are valid, uh, and the challenges, as I mentioned, with clinical exams still exist. But basically, uh, we have proven that they are practical, they are valid, and as I say, they are here to stay. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Mark. And I'm going to very briefly now try to just do a three or four points from every lecture. But there is one question from the audience also. Yeah, if you can feel that while I try to get this. Uh, yep. Sushit. Um, Sushit, you can ask the question. Yeah. But okay. just you tell me, that, can you see the screen? Are you seeing my screen? Yes. yes, we are able to see the screen, but you can start the slideshow. Yeah, okay, fine. After the question is over. Yeah. 
So there's a question from the audience. I conducted 12 virtual synchronous national virtual journal club for orthopedic trainees in Pakistan An author of a published article in journal of Pakistan orthopedic association would use to present the article in virtual journal club on zoom. It is attended by trainees all over Pakistan of one hour duration with expert discussion and question answer session. Recording is also available in YouTube. The feedback was encouraging. We plan similar programs in the future in the hybrid fashion. So what do you think about this program and any guidance? Steve, so you talked about online programs. Can you give us your feedback? Yes, first of all, congratulations on success. So uh, I think it's a... I think it's really the best uh, scenario you can use a virtual type of um, conference because I suppose it's a national meeting involving residents from different hospitals, cities, uh, yeah, from different cities. You it's quite unlikely you can travel to one city just for a one hour type of uh, journal club. And uh, I, but uh, I, 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 it's also a good idea to make a hybrid. So I would suggest every um, different center can host it be a host for one uh, particular session and other hospital residents can join it uh, virtually. Would be the best if you can invite more senior people uh, or also some representative, as you mentioned in the, um, in your, for example, in your Pakistan journal to give some feedback or that's the host hospital can also present one to two of their research project to ask for any opinion from other, um, other hospital and other senior. I think that will be a uh, good idea. Yes. Thank you, Steve. Um, Dr. Mark and Dr. Mark, your opinions? Um, yeah, I think um, um, journal clubs, it's certainly the way forward. They're so easy to organize. And whereas before, uh, you never quite knew how many people were going to turn up for journal club. Uh, now, nobody has any excuses uh, not to turn up. And as you say, you can get easily get senior people involved nationally and internationally uh, and give great um, gravitas to the meeting. Uh, any other feedback? Shushi, can I just do the review of all the talks so that yes. we get the take-home message for everyone? Yes, sure. So starting with uh, Mark Hansen, um, he spoke about online life surgeries. He talked about the fact that it's not a very new thing, but now there are a lot of changes, especially with the implementation of 3D technology. He spoke about student surveys, which were generally positive, but we found that the students were not willing to pay, but they thought the service was very good. Um, he discussed about some risks to patients during the procedures and what has to be done to rectify that, talked about ethics of the situation, and he discussed CAD lab programs which are done in the air. Uh, Dr. Syed Ulthani talked about uh, cadaveric programs. He talked about increased training confidence, which comes from doing the same procedure several times, from a knowledge, increased knowledge of anatomy. And he found that the feedback programs were generally useful um, to the students, but there were some shortcomings. It was expensive. And he felt that virtual is not a full substitute for the real thing. Um, Dr. Sasinder uh, showed us a lot of uh, um, pictures and he showed us simulation of techniques, which are very vital. He discussed about how this leads to increased competence and confidence. And he compared the entire process with aviation safety, which is commercial aviation, as we know, is very, very uh, safe nowadays. He discussed the various types of virtual re uh, reality types, augmented virtual reality, mixed reality, collaborative reality, where a couple of surgeons will be able to um, do a particular surgery together, just the way people play online games in, in across the world. Um, Dr. Steve Chung of Hong Kong spoke about webinars, about online courses, conferences, and he found that orthopedics ranked only ranked number three, which is very good, just after general medicine and general surgery. 
So orthopedics have been keeping up with online technology. He said that a good moderator and people he, who keep to time are important and that uh, experts on the topic should be engaged. He discussed the various meetings all over the world, starting from centers, uh, courses like AO, SICOT, the Young Surgeons Committee meeting, and it led to more participants because people from all over the world could participate as well as we could have teachers from all over the world. And it led to a good feedback and better peer review and comparing uh, online and traditional teaching, he thought that Zoom had scored very well, but perhaps not so well in clinical studies. Um, and he also fa feel that in 2023, it's still not in a position where it can replace face-to-face -face meetings, but is a good uh, uh, sort of uh, complementary system. Uh, Dr. Mark Patterson, who is our, the head examiner of SICOT, spoke about the changes which are coming in SICOT. He found that the MCQ scores are very valid, whether they're counted manually or virtually. The VIVAs um, are also, it can be organized very well, provided there is a good environment and we have sufficient audiovisual quality. The OSCE in clinical, however, he found was still not very good because it's there are a lot of challenges, but it does save money and it needs good administration. A very large question bank is required and very good IT support. There is requirement of training the examinees and the examiners. Examiner exam security is very important. The examinee's identity. Live proctoring is a, a problem, but may improve with perhaps uh, better cameras and lots of AI support. And because we have to do something to make sure that no one is cheating, because we can't allow um, the questions to be around for too long because the uh, examinee can easily go to Google and check the answer. Um, but the advantage from his point of view and others who are running the course is that they can do an overall uh, review very easily and they can review the steps of the uh, procedure and he just he showed the workflow about how it will proceed. So with this, I think we have tried to cover a pretty uh, vast topic and I tried to bring out three or four points which all of you uh, have discussed. Now, I'll just end this thing with my personal views. So I think online technology is here to stay, but it is unlikely at this point to replace on-site activity. It will continue to act as a vital supplement for conferences and courses. It is cheap and fast with worldwide outreach, but is much less fun than actual interaction. We all know that. We don't get the same high the way you would in a conference or conducting a course. But, and today we have a lot of post-COVID uh, return to function, revenge tourism, revenge courses, revenge conferences. So we should take advantage of that as well not just restrict ourselves to the online world, but also come, consider coming back somewhat to the um, interaction in front. But we, um, there are online worlds which have been tried apart from examinations like Meta in um, Facebook is not really working very well. I think Facebook has lost billions of dollars. And perhaps the answer to that why things like Meta have not really succeeded so much is because ultimately we are humans and not zombies. So what will happen in 2032? So the answer, my friend, I think is uh, blowing in the wind. We don't know, but we know virtual uh, work is here to stay. Whether it will take over from the real world, we don't know. Let's see what happens in 2032. Thank you. So this is the next uh, meeting we have. So we've put up the slide for those who wish to attend on 25th of April. Um, do we have any question, uh, time for questions, Sufian? Any burning question which we would, anyone would like to ask? Sufian, are you there? From the audience. Uh, do, can we take questions for two or three minutes? 
Oh, yes, there's still time if you have. Okay. So, um, anyone with any question, anything to the speakers? Any question? Okay. Then, in that case, I think um, I think we have covered the topic fairly broadly, and uh, I think everyone has understood the take-home message. So, I think we will finish the meeting here. And just to say that the Education Committee will be organizing two more webinars this year, and we'll come back to you with the program. We hope you will attend. And I hope that those who have heard this um, online um, pioneer program have enjoyed it and taken home some messages. Thank you very much. Okay, so, Sufian, I think we can finish the meeting.